I'm just going to be very brief, which is unusual, I know. So, um, our next speaker needs no introduction, so I will not uh, even attempt to recite um, the significance of what he has written to this crowd especially. But, just as I do when I embarrass my children, let me tell you a story. I spoke about... Uh, canvases in my opening talk. So this story is about another canvas, and our somewhat archaic and quaint parochial canvas in this day and age. Uh, it's a canvas that, require, that requires just a little bit of ink and a few sheets of paper. Uh, I did not know Robert before this exchange happened. I learned through some search that he lived in Canada, and he lived on the West Coast. And having been, uh, having been born in India, although having left as a young boy, I have full faith in the postal system. So Indian addresses, in case th those who have not ever mailed a letter in India, will read something like, Mr. So-and-so, behind Parvati Cinema, third floor, central room. And you can be guaranteed, almost guaranteed, the letter will get there within two days. Uh, so I penned a letter. And I said, Robert Bringhurst, Quadra Island, British Columbia. And somehow, by the magic of Canada Post, it arrived. <laughs> and then even more of a miracle, Robert chose to acknowledge it and respond. And so began a conversation. And I, it, it's a thrill, it's an honor. And I'm utterly delighted that he accepted our offer to come and speak. So, round of applause, please. Thank you very much, Pavneet. Um, it was a real letter. I mean, it was written with a real pen on real paper. Uh, I don't get those very often anymore. Um, well. I think of, um, of uh, the tech users group as uh, one of the more thank you one of the more uh, forward-looking entities in the typographic uh, world, but this will be a backward-looking lecture, uh, very very backward. Um, three important type designers died in 2015: Bram de Dos in the Netherlands, Adrian Frutiger in Switzerland, and. Hermann Zapf in Germany. <coughs> Hermann was old enough to be my father, uh, but he had also become my friend. And when he died on the 4th of June last year, I was uh, working uh, uh, on a book, finishing up a book, in fact, about his uh, work, uh, a detailed study of the extended type family called Palatino. The only problem was I had no idea who might publish this uh, book. It had to contain good color reproductions of uh, Hermann's sketches and working drawings, and, uh, some good photographs of uh, pieces of type. Um, uh, it also had to contain real specimens printed from metal foundry type and from linotype. So it had to be printed letterpress and it had to be printed offset and it had to be printed well. And, you know, uh, publishers don't do this anymore. Um, the Book Club of California in San Francisco uh, found itself in sudden need of a book to fill an unexpected hole in its list, um, and the Book Club had the resources to produce this book the way I wanted it produced. Uh, and, and then um, and, and they had the ability to sell it uh, at a price uh, that would 
bring them back what they would have to invest. And then David Goodin in Boston uh, 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 said he would like to publish a trade edition uh, if it could be printed at the same time. Um, and suddenly all the practical problems, or most of them, uh, had disappeared. Um, so the book exists. <coughs> Zapf worked on his Palatino project for six decades. It began uh, when metal foundry type and line casting machines still reigned supreme, and it continued into the era of sophisticated third generation digital type. And that's one reason why it seemed to me worth writing about. Another reason, of course, is that Zapf was a brilliant designer, one of the best who ever lived. Palatino is just one thread in his long uh, and complex career, but it's a thread that runs all the way through, uniting 60 years of active work. I think it reveals a good deal about the man and about his talents and his concerns and about the industrial and cultural situation that prevailed during a crucial and tumultuous period in the history of typography, and also about the profound and yet to many people mysteriously invisible difference between metal type and digital type. So I'm going to talk about these things and I'm going to show you some pictures um, insofar as the projector allows that to happen. Um, but the pictures are all, of course, digital representations. They're digital representations of two- and three-dimensional objects, drawings, sketches, pieces of calligraphy, pieces of metal type, and pages printed in three dimensions from real metal type, and pages printed in two dimensions from zero-dimensional digital type. And that means these digital pictures can't show you the differences I've been talking about. They are all digital images, many of them of non-digital things, so you have to use your imagination to see the difference between one picture and another. And that's the story of my life. Technology pushes one way and I push the other, and it looks most of the time like technology wins, but in the long run reality wins instead, and if we're interested the rest of us get stretched along the way. This is a 60-point Michelangelo O cast on a 48-point body. The points in question are Dido points, about 7% larger than postscript points, but of course the letter form is magnified here to a size beyond the realm in which digital, in which Dido points or postscript points are generally used. In real life, this O exists at absolute scale, and here that scale is being ignored. It's a beautiful letter. You know? It's mathematically beautiful. It's uh, physically beautiful, um, and that beauty survives when the ink is put on the form and the form is pressed into the paper. It even survives when it's digitized. Herman was a great calligrapher. Uh, yeah. All right, I'll learn to operate this machine in a minute. He was a great calligrapher. He loved music as much as he loved poetry, and he loved mathematics as much as he loved music. And he really knew how to make letters. And he was a great typographer. And he was a great type designer. And he was a great book designer as well. Book designers generally live by commissions, and while Zapf designed a large number of lovely books, he didn't always get the commissions he wanted. He also had a problem the rest of us share, which is that his best designs were sometimes rejected by his clients. None of the three book pages I've just shown you was actually produced. These are all Zapf's improvements, huge improvements in fact, on other people's work. 
his suggestions for how things should have been done but weren't. Um, in other words, he loved designing books so much that he would just do it for his own pleasure. He'd buy a book in a bookstore, take it home, and redesign it <laughs> to suit himself. <laughs> that's where these that's where these designs came from. He loved poetry and music, and of course he loved visual art, and he loved the sciences and mathematics. One of his few complaints in life was that no one had ever commissioned him to design a serious mathematical publication. So in the late 1950s, he redesigned and reset for the fun of it part of Nicolas Bourbaki's Element de Mathématiques, Fonction d'une variable réelle. That's what you see here. Several things attracted him to this book. For one thing, it was published in Paris by Edition Hermann et Compagnie, so his name, Hermann, was on the title page. <laughs> For another, the author was fictitious. Nicolas Bourbaki, as I'm sure you all know, is a famous 20th century mathematician who does not exist. And then the typography in the original real edition of this book, the one that was actually printed, was monumentally dull and awkward as it is in so many mathematical books. So this is a real design for a fictitious edition of a real book by a fictitious author. It is set, as you see, on a linotype machine using William Addison Dwiggins's Caledonia. The designer of these sophisticated multilingual pages and the maker of these sophisticated polylingual pieces of calligraphy I've just been showing you was booted out of school at the age of 14 because his father was an anti-Nazi labor organizer in Germany. And Hermann learned his Greek and Latin the same way he learned his mathematics and his English and his French and almost everything else by visiting libraries and museums, reading books, watching other people work, and working alongside them. In 1941, at the age of 22, he found himself a conscript in the German army. Late that year, he was assigned duty as a cartographer in the German garrison at Dijon, in occupied France. This is a sketch he made the following spring. It's a commandeered townhouse in Dijon that served for a while as the headquarters of Mapping Corps Detachment 235. He was stationed there for two comparatively blissful months while the war was raging in other places. One of those windows on the second floor of this house was his. And this is what the room looked like from the inside. Pretty good arrangements for a conscript in wartime. He was able to spend a lot of that time drawing trees and flowers and shrubbery and sometimes human beings. Oh, you've got to be careful what you touch. Um, and often in the sketchbooks he kept in those years, uh, the pictures of plants uh, are, and insects uh, are combined with calligraphy. Uh, the text is usually a poem he knew by heart or one that he found in the garrison library. And the calligraphy, like the draftsmanship, um, is really first class, although it is quite deliberately Germanic. He was a deadly serious calligrapher and a budding type designer already in 1939 when the war was just beginning. He drew two music types when he was 18 years of age, and both of those were cut and cast when he was 19. Like much else in Germany, they were also destroyed by Allied bombing a short time later. He returned to type design in a serious way in 1946, and by 1948 he had drawn a Roman type, an antiqua, as the Germans call it, that is, in essence, Palatino-Roman, this thing. And his name for it then was Medici. The Italic, as you see, has a ways to go yet, but the Roman is almost there. One of the problems with the Italic is that it hasn't quite made up its mind how to balance the German and Italian parts of its heritage. It also hasn't solved an additional problem that the designer thrust upon it, You'll see that the italic letters here are drawn to the same set width as the Roman. They don't do an adequate job of filling up the space, but that's a task the designer had given them when he was trying to solve 
and that means you wanted the face to function on a linotype machine where Roman and italic letters have to share a single matrix. Two years later, things had changed. This italic, still called Medici, had set widths of its own, not borrowed from any Roman, and the forms had become decidedly Italian, not, not halfway between Italian and German. The date of the underlying drawing here is June 1949. Smoke proofs are pasted on top of the drawing. Most of those were made between March and early May 1950. The swash smoke proofs were made the following year, July 1951. All this work was done at the Stempel foundry in Frankfurt, and the cutting was done by Stempel's master punch cutter, August Rosenberger, whom you'll meet in a few moments. The lowercase g uh, was uh, a difficult letter, as it almost always is for type designers, but in the end, the problem was beautifully solved. There was one aspect of German typographic practice that Zapf was reluctant to part with. Like any good calligrapher, he, en calligrapher, he enjoyed making ligatures, and he was very, very good at it but the German CH and CK ligatures make no linguistic sense in French or Italian or in English. And that CH ligature with its CK counterpart was actually cut and cast, but it never left the foundry. The only book in which those ligatures were used was designed and printed at the Stempel foundry by Zapp's friend Gotthard de Beauclerc, a thoroughly German person in spite of his French name. Um, this is a lovely edition of a short prose piece called Vom Alleinsein by Rainer Maria Rilke, printed at Stempel in 1951. You can find the ligatures, I'm sure, without trouble. This is the final working drawing for the Roman type, made in 1949. And this is the 48 point size of that Roman, cut and cast in 1951. The CH and CK ligatures are here too, of course, but in Roman they cause no legibility problem as they do for some of us in our tongue. There's some of the type itself. And there's some of the italic. By 1960, the Palatino family had grown to include a considerable range of metal type. There was the foundry Roman and italic, cut from a number of different patterns, sized from 5 to 72 point. Two of those sizes, 5 and 9 point, were cut with long descenders, everything else with short descenders only. There was linotype Palatino with its much wider italic and a slightly different Roman, sized from 6 to 12 point with long and short descenders in every size. This proved so popular that it was issued as a foundry face as well, so you could set that relatively ugly wide italic by hand if you wanted to do so. There was Aldus, also 6 to 12 point, with its narrow companion, Enge Aldus. Uh, Aldus in 6 to 12 point, Enge Aldus in only one size, 9 point. Almost nobody wanted to buy that face, and it is now almost impossible to find even in places that sell old type. Uh, but it is a very beautiful piece of design and the italic uh, is like no other that ever existed. And then there was the, the Greek foundry face, Heraclit, uh, also made uh, from six to 12 point, uh, a complete uh, Greek font with all the accents and diacritics required for classical Greek cast uh, in four sizes for hand composition. There were, um, there was the uh, swash italic, the foundry face from six to 48 point, and there was Palatino's semi-bold Roman, that's what they always called it, halb fet. Um, but there was nothing so barbaric as bold italic. Nobody wanted it, nobody made it. There was also no bold weight for any of the other faces in the family. All this, hang on, all this, heraclete. Uh, the bold was just to be used the way bold faces are supposed to be used, which is not very often. 
Then there were three lovely display faces consisting of capitals only, Michelangelo, Sistina, Phidias, Greek, all these available in, as foundry type only from 16 to 72 point. The Sistina, the one in the middle, proved very popular and so it was cut in a larger size, 84 point, and then it was cut as a poster type in wood and in resin uh, at sizes from 8 to 40 Cicero, that is 96 to 480 point. I said he would meet August Rosenberger and here he is actually cutting and proofing some large Palatino caps. Rosenberger cut all the, small, all the smaller trial sizes of the Palatino family fonts in type in, in steel uh, and he cut the larger trial sizes in soft metal and then he made the pattern plates for every size of every foundry face. Um, this is the one of the several pattern plates for 14 point Palatino. Sistina however required some extra work Zaff was in Italy in the fall of 1950. And while he was there, he made some rubbings of inscriptions on the Palatine Hill, the place for which his type was named, though he had never seen it when he drew the type. The inscriptions in robust Roman capitals had rough edges, and Zaff wanted some of that roughness in Sistina. This is, uh, these are smoke proofs made by Rosenberger when he was trying to get the texture Zapf had asked for, and that's Rosenberger's annotation in the, at the lower right, made just a month after Zapf had made his rubbing. Type production was pretty fast in those days, though it was all, almost all done by hand. And so the note tells us that Rosenberger thinks the H is good. Uh, he's not quite through working on the Q. The texture of these edges is different in every size. There's a row of D's from 60 point to 28 point, and you can see, I hope, that the edge texture is different in each size. In the wood type, this was impossible, because wood type is cut with a pantographic saw, not cast from a matrix. So the wood and resin versions of Sistina have smooth edges and look like some, an entirely different typeface. They also have, like most wooden types, no descendants. The linotype faces were produced by different methods again. A linotype machine needs matrices, not sorts, and to make the matrices you need an especially hard machine-cut master punch that can be driven into matrix metal over and over again. So what you make from the master drawings are pantographic patterns that can be used to guide a punch cutting machine. And just as for foundry type, different patterns are used for different sizes. Here there are three patterns for three different sizes of the oldest lowercase e. From the left, these are the six point, eight point, and ten point patterns. And on the right, the pattern for the nine point enga oldest, the narrower version of the same face. I don't know if you can read the small print that's stamped into the bottom of these plates, but uh, if you can, you can see there the names that were actually used in the foundry for these faces. Aldous was called Palatino Light, and Enga Aldous was called Schmal Aldous, meaning the same thing. This drawing is undated, but it was probably made in 1953. It was around that time that Zapf became convinced that Palatino was too subtle, too sophisticated, too elegant for North American tastes. <laughs> so what he's done here is revise the shapes of capital E, F, and S, and of lowercase p, q, s, v, w, and y. There are some other details marked on this drawing having to do with the shape of the capital K and the proportions of the semicolon but those have nothing to do with Zapp's low opinion of North American typographic knowledge. Stempel and the, the Stempel Foundry managers and their master designer, Hermann Zapp, disagreed about a great many things, but they were of one mind about the North American mind and the North American market. 
They believed that North Americans would prefer a plainer and sturdier and less cultivated form of Palatino, and apparently they were right. The new American letters are shown here in black and the original European forms in red. The letters in blue survived without change, except for the capital K, which had been altered slightly already, more or less in secret. Death was always making improvements, smuggling them in when he couldn't get them made in a formal public way. Commercially, this new form of Palatino was a great success, and it is the only form most North Americans have ever seen. Changes were made to the export versions of the linotype fonts as well. So here you see on the top the master patterns for the 9 and 10 point ash, or AE ligature, in the original design, and the corresponding patterns for the export version below. Next, of course, came phototype. Linotype had its own proprietary system for phototype setting, known as Linofilm. And when Palatino was adapted for the line of film system in 1963, Zapf redrew every letter in the alphabet. His starting point for this wholesale redesign was export Palatino, the Americanized, dumbed down version of the face. And when Palatino was digitized, starting in 1978, the line of film version served as the primary model. For that reason, most people living now, even in Germany, have never seen any form of Palatino except, basically, the American version. In the meantime, other things were happening. Zapf was a lyrical artist, and his lyricism kept looking for an outlet. Here's a sketch, one of many that he made in 1970, dreaming of a time when phototype or digital type could accommodate real scriptorial energy. And here's a working drawing made in 1983 or 84 for the typeface that grew out of those sketches. This face is called Zapf Renaissance. It too is a revision of Palatino, made for, digital, for a digital typesetting pioneer called Marius Bulger in Hamburg. Bulger's typesetting system, known as Scan Graphic, could handle automated contextual substitution of glyphs, and it could do this in 1985, when most other digital typesetting systems were still struggling with tiny character sets and basic issues of rendering and spacing. But as you also all know, one of the rules of technological development is that winners often lose. And by 1990, Scan Graphic and Zap Renaissance had vanished, leaving very little trace. Keeping the story as brief as possible, I'll say that the next major event in the life of Palatino was its adaptation to open type. This happened in 1997, and it produced a whole family of tri-alphabetic fonts, such as the one you see here. The Cyrillic is a brand new design. The Greek is a digital revision of foundry Heraclete from the 1950s. The Latin forms are essentially unchanged from linofilm Palatino, the phototype revision of the Americanized version of the original European foundry type. The result is called Palatino Linotype, not Linotype Palatino, and you all probably have this font on your computers. After the turn of the millennium, when Zapf was in his 80s, he began to think about redesigning another of his most successful faces, Optima. The earliest digital versions of Optima were failures because digital output devices in those days did not have enough fine, resolu uh, fine enough resolution to render the subtly tapered stems. That problem had been solved, and in 2003, a new digital version called Optima Novo was released. It had a real italic. It had some very fancy uh, cap ligatures for display use. It had real small caps old-style figures, and uh, other goodies that were missing from the earlier versions. Zapf had never really worked with digital tools. Repeated crashes with early computers had taught him not to trust the machines with his design work. He did use a computer to type quite a lot of his correspondence, but he did his designing in the way he had always done it, 
with pencils and pens on pieces of paper. So to make Optima Nova, he worked with Linotype's head of design, Akira Kobayashi. Akira sat at the computer in Bad Homburg, north of Frankfurt, and Hermann sat right behind him, looking over Akira's shoulder at the screen, saying, yes, no, do this, do that, don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> so there were no drawings, no smoke proofs, no, almost no records of what went on. But the result was this face, Optima Nova, released in 2003. Zapf was pleased with the result and agreed to do the same thing with Palatino and Aldis. The result was Palatino Nova, completed in 2005, and Aldis Nova issued in the same year. The character set in these fonts uh, is a good character set, I should say, uh, are a good deal smaller than in Palatino Linotype because the Greek is monotonic, that is, it has enough accents only for modern Greek, not for the classical language, and there is no Vietnamese, and the Cyrillic is restricted to basic Western Slavic characters. It's sufficient for Russian, Ukrainian, Serbo-Croatian, Bulgarian, but not for very much else. And in Aldus Nova, which you're looking at here, there is no Greek or Cyrillic at all, just as there is no, still no bold face. It just so happens that while Palatino was going through its very long series of transformations, Zapf was also doing a lot of doodling with similarly energetic and distinctive sans serif letters. This is an example, a sketch made in 1973. Here's a more sober sketch, undated, but from the same rough period of time, sometime in the 1970s, of a sans serif Greek and Cyrillic. Strange as it may seem, according to Zapf, no one was interested in these sketches. He showed them to the managers at Stempel, and their response was an unequivocal no. So the sketches stayed in his desk drawer. And then in 2004, while Palatino Nova was under development, Otmar Hofer at Linotype asked Zapf if he'd like to do a Palatino Sands. Actually, Herman said, I've been working on it for almost 40 years. And so <laughs> Palatino Sands came into existence quite rapidly. It was issued in 2006. When, oops, oh dear, what have I done? Help. Sorry, it's the computer is timing out. No, I, I, I hit the, the touchpad with my thumb. That's uh, end of presentation. Yeah. Click to exit. That's that's where it is. There we go. I'm back into it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry for the um, interruption. There we are. Oh, there we are. Yep. Palatino Sands came into existence quite quickly. It was issued in 2006 when the designer was 87. Uh, the design, uh, you could perhaps sense that from those sketches, was rich in alternate forms. Uh, but Linotype wanted to get this face on the market as quickly as possible, and so to simplify production, the alternates were split into two discrete bundles called formal or informal, and there is no convenient provision for mixing the two up, as I like to do myself. This is the lower case. These are the caps and the small caps. It's a very nice piece of design, and I find it a very useful typeface. But is it really Palatino, or did they just decide to call it that because the name would help to sell it? I'll leave you with that question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of comments and questions, so there are none? <laughs> okay, Steve. Um, it was interesting how you pointed out that he was starting to design type in the late 30s. Was he a, was he, was he a teenager then? I can't quite remember. Yes, yes. Okay. He and was pretty good at it when he was 18. Exactly okay. when he started, I couldn't tell. Was there, was 
presumably a relationship between his calligraphy and thinking about the mechanical process of a type of a reproduction. Yeah, the relationship was he just naturally was a, a great calligrapher uh, and he had great talent for it uh, and he liked doing it and he also was stone broke and one of the ways <laughs> calligraphers could make money in Germany in those days was by designing type. And it looks like that sort of um, process of, uh, of thinking about type is, uh, in, uh, is being lost obviously because so little handwriting is being paid attention to in these days, I assume, uh, and designed by the two current, I don't, I don't know anybody designing the type right now, designing fonts and so on, but that relationship... Ask Kevin. <laughs> He's got oh, yeah. lots of people designing fonts. Right. But the relationship between paper and the land on paper and so on, and then the uh, mechanical processes that we're uh, being directed towards is Distances there and uh, uh, fewer opportunities for the experience of that, of that relationship. Well, this process uh, didn't start yesterday. You know, there were a lot of people designing type uh, in the 1930s who also had no calligraphic experience or interest, uh, and that, that's what their type looks like. Uh, and there are a lot of people who want their type to look like that. They want it to look like it was made by a machine and is uh, intended to be read by machines. If that's what you want, you can have it. There are designers working right now who are terrific calligraphers, uh, and there'll be some tomorrow. Would you like the rest No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I think Euler is a very interesting uh, face, especially the Greek. Um, what's wrong with it, from my point of view, is that it was it was only produced as a mathematical face. Doesn't have the diacritics uh, or some of the some of the extra characters, the terminal sigma, for example, that uh, are absolutely essential for setting Greek text, even in modern Greek. Never mind the classical building. Um, so uh, I'm probably not the only person who's made a, a, a working version of, of Euler for Greek text. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's a lovely thing to work with. The, the Latin version of the face, uh, I've never found a use for outside the narrow realm for which it was designed, but the, the Greek uh, is, has, has many other uses. Christian? method, of course, is offset. Uh, uh, American Palatino is something that Herman made because he wanted to make it. Uh, it's not something that was forced upon him. Um, uh, he, of course, used his own type uh, almost every day of his life. So he used the, the European version of the, of the face. He used the American version when he wanted to. Um, but you can only use type in the medium for which it exists. So if you're setting a book uh, on a phototype machine, you have to use phototype. There uh, was no phototype version of the original Foundry Palatino, except uh, a, a pirate, some pirated versions, uh, which of course Sap wouldn't use, and which he <laughs> railed against at every opportunity. Um, 
uh, we could talk a little bit if we have time about um, about uh, pirated versions. This uh, most of the pirated versions of Palatino are, of course, uh, phototype and digital type. Uh, the phototype versions have disappeared because phototype itself has basically disappeared. Uh, but there were also metal pirated versions. This uh, is the uh, you know, th these are some matrices for. Uh, uh, a fake Palatino for a Ludlow line caster. These are the, the, the back sides of the matrices, the ones that the operator actually sees where the, the letter forms are filled with paint so you can see what's there. These are the fronts of the same matrices, the, the casting side where the, the letters are more deeply recessed into the matrix material. Um, and I hope now you've seen enough real Palatino that you can spot these for fakes from across the room, right? <laughs> they were not drawn by Hermann Zapf. They were copied by somebody else. Uh, here's the most famous and successful fake Palatino of all, uh, which came into existence uh, uh, in 1991, I think. Um, uh, it was made by Monotype for Microsoft uh, and given away uh, under the name Book Antiqua. Uh, it uh, was shipped with every PC uh, ever made and may still be shipping with every PC ever made, even though it has no use anymore because Palatino Linotype replaced it. Um, but bad fonts like bad information can be very difficult to get rid of once they spread around. Um, it's easy to tell the difference between uh, Book Antiqua and Palatino Nova, if, uh, Palatino, rather, Palatino, any Palatino, if you have a magnifying glass uh, or a very good eye. The outline versions in the top line are, uh, are Book Antiqua and the gray versions underneath them are real Palatino. But in the Greek and Cyrillic, the differences are obvious to anybody. That's because Greek and Cyrillic Palatino didn't exist when the, this fake Palatino was made, so the copiers had nothing to copy. They had to make their own, and they made that ugly Cyrillic and that even uglier Greek uh, because they didn't have a better model. Um, so that's not the answer to your question, but it has something to, I hope, to do with it. Zapf liked using real type and he wanted everybody else to do the same. Uh, he was happy to use his own real type, the American version as well as the uh, original version. Uh, not only that, he liked mixing them up so it looks like there are more kinds of Palatino than there actually are. Um, is, that, is that enough? Yeah. Anyone uh, else? Nice book. Any other questions? Uh, let me. Sorry, Carl, go ahead. I a different topic about working methods. It's just that in every, I mean, I'm sure in everything I've ever seen in Zach never touched his hand was beautiful. And I just wonder if in your research you saw things which like didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Throwaways. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, Herman's dream was to become an electrical engineer, not, uh, not a type designer. Um, and when he was a very young boy, like nine or ten years old, he started making, uh, you know, as kids sometimes do, books uh, with, with pencil and graph paper and staples uh, about electrical engineering. Um, it looks uh, initially as if he had very little talent. Um, uh, but things changed very, very quickly. Um, and in much, much later in his life, when he got involved with some New York advertising people, they talked him into doing a couple of pretty uninteresting typefaces, uh, uh, which you know anybody else could have done equally well. But there. That accounts for you know a, a quarter of one percent of his life's work. Yeah. So when he was designing Palatino or any of his real faces, I mean, he must have had hundreds of drafts of a given letter. Yep. It, but it's more about choosing the one that uh, uh, embodies the 
bodies that was aligned that he had in mind. I mean, he was well beyond working out any technical problems early on that was fair. Everyone loves technical problems, and, yeah. and so you know he, he he never he never imagined that he had any of them completely solved. Uh, they were part of the driving force that led him to do what he did. Um, uh, and type design is not ever a one-man show. You know, you uh, you make uh, adjustments because there are other people involved, and they say, "Well, I'd really like it to be like this," or "I really need." To have to, to have this character, or to, to have this character work this way, or to have this alternate form, or something, um, and then you know, machine manufacturers say, "Well, but we have this unit system here." You know, uh, Lionetype fonts are made in an 18 unit system. That may sound like plenty, but in six point type, 18 units to the M means you know, it's a big jump from one unit to the next. Uh, Postscript, where there are a thousand units to the M, we forget about that. But Postscript, of course, has its uh, limitations and, and problems too. You never, you never run out of these things. And he loved them. He thought this was great. Chuck, a quick commercial question: uh, Is the trade edition and the book club of California editions of your book out now? Ah. Oh. <laughs> Actually, I, I, yes, and I have a follow-up to that because I, all I saw was a pre-order available in November. Right, okay. Um, the, the, the Book Club of California edition sold out on publication day. Uh, uh, all the books were printed and bound at the same time. Uh, so uh, the trade edition exists, it's finished, it's sitting in David's warehouse in uh, Nashua, New Hampshire. Uh, I don't know why he hasn't put it in the stores yet, but it's there. Uh, uh, there are only a thousand copies so, uh, of the trade edition. So, Amazon uh, says pre ordered for, for November. That's, yeah, yeah, that's well, what. Well, that the, the original, nobody expected the book club edition to sell out so quickly. So, so the, <laughs> the uh, provisional arrangement was that David Godin could not sell his edition until this fall, sometime when presumably the book club's edition would be gone. Um, but uh, practically speaking, this hardly matters. Anyway, if you if you want a copy of the trade edition, I suggest you order it soon. Order it right now. Well, this is what I'm seeing. Everyone's on their phone, so I know yeah. the Amazon uh, server has just crashed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Chuck, if you're still uh, on speaking terms with Rochester, they they have the the, the book club edition in, in the Carrie collection, and you you don't need to buy one for. Your... I saw it weeks ago. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. And the book club edition is done and done, never to be revived. Uh, I think only Boris has. Yeah, no, it'll be, yeah. the, the, the book club edition. Is, 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 that, that, that's it. I mean, that, 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 those are the rules. You'll have to buy it from somebody who dies. Kijiji, or Kijiji, start like searching this. Kijiji. Any other questions, comments for Robert? You folks need to have your annual meeting. I don't want to delay your... your oh, no, 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 no. Uh, Annual meeting? Are we having an annual meeting? Way, uh, if I may, uh, if I, yes, I, I bought this book, so I, I want to share with you some other, uh, some, some other really rare book that we, uh, 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 Rick is going to publish. They're publishing uh, a book of Zap's uh, students in calligraphy. It's, it's going to be a... Uh, and, and again, it's very minute. So, if, if you carry up, you, 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 you can get it. So, in, in closing for now, although um, I, I think Robert will be gracious enough, let's not inundate him with all of our copies of uh, <laughs> the book. Um, small token of appreciation, Robert. I hope uh, you don't mind. Uh, the, a similar model to the pen with which I wrote you that letter yep. is there, and we'd like <laughs> you to take one and, oh, uh, wow. and some ink bottles for wow. your. Um, that's the perfect gift. I love fountain pens. I <laughs> never go anywhere without one. Uh, but I don't have one like that. Thank you very much.
one world, one block. This is all from India. Yeah. And these have no clarity. So, so, and I will get to this. There is a And this, this pen design is uh, from the turn of the century. And it's from manufacturing my book. Those people who might want you to sign the book might have one to fill. <laughs> Royal blue. If you oh. want to test it out, oh, this paper is not bad. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. That's great. <laughs> so, yep. And I have, yep. I do some playing around. I bent this nib a little bit to make it slightly italic. That's yeah. a really yeah. extra. You got a, a, a cap for this? Yes. That makes me nervous to no. sitting around like uh, <laughs> unsheathed. Uh, and that's the slightly italic one. So your preference. But, uh, but I'll leave both of them here for you to for whoever wants to sign. Okay, thanks very much. If you don't mind, whenever you have a chance. I can you check that for it's Unix. Thanks very much for letting me use your so these are these are yours. These those three are mine. Oh, great, <laughs>